Hi everyone, thank you for joining AWMP grad seminar. Today we have two speakers. Our first speaker name is Elisa Vitale. She is a PhD student from International School for Advanced Studies from Italy. Her topic is motive of code schemes on curves. Our second speaker name is Valentina Bayes. Uh, she's also from International School for Advanced Studies. And her topic is on Stiefel's Parallelizability Theorem for Close Three Manifolds. So our first speaker, Elisa Vitale, you can proceed. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation and for the introduction. I will now uh, share my screen. Um, okay. Can you see my screen now? No, not yet. Uh, let's see. What about now? Yes. Very good. Okay, that's great. Okay. So I'll start now. So I am, uh, as you said, a PhD student at CISA in Italy. And uh, in this short seminar, I would like to tell you a little bit about the story that leads to uh, the project I'm working on at the moment. So the topic of my current project is motive of quad schemes on curves. I will not assume that uh, uh, people in the audience know what motives and quad schemes are. So I will uh, devote the first part of my talk to explaining uh, these two definitions. And then I will move on to tell you what is known at this point uh, about motives of quad schemes on smooth curves. And at the end, I'll tell you more about my current project, okay? So um, also I'll try to make my uh, presentation accessible, but I have to start at some point. So uh, I will assume some basic notions of algebraic geometry, but if you don't know, for example, what a scheme is, you can uh, substitute this with uh, variety. And whenever I'll talk about sheaves, I'll try to give some intuition with using vector bundles. And uh, everything I will say will be uh, over the complex numbers, but I think that if you replace that with an algebraically closed field, then uh, nothing should change. So let's start with uh, the definition of motive. So a motive is an object that lives in the Grothendieck ring of varieties, which is defined as follows. We start by considering this set, which is uh, the set of isomorphism classes of complex varieties. And we consider the free abelian group generated by uh, this set of generators. And this is going to be the underlying uh, set of our ring. We define two operations as follows. So the sum of two classes is going to be the class of the disjoint union. And uh, you can see that the zero element is going to be the class of the empty set. And the product of two classes is going to be the class of the product of two varieties with identity given by uh, the class of a single point. We also require that this ring uh, encodes some, some relations called scissor relations. So uh, these relations say that for any closed subvariety, we can write the motive of X as the motive of this closed subvariety plus the motive of the complement. And this is the definition of Grothendieck ring. And basically, once we fix, once we have a complex uh, variety, the motive of this complex variety is going to be the corresponding class in the Grothendieck ring. Okay, so motives are elements in the Grothendieck ring. Let's see some examples. The first and most important example is the motive of the affine line, which is denoted by L and called the Leschetz motive. This motive is very important for, I guess, two reasons. The first one is that it is a zero divisor in the ring. So the Grothendieck ring is not a domain. 
And the second one is that we can use it to obtain uh, many other uh, elements in the growth in the ring. So for example, if we consider the class of the affine space, so affine space um, can be written as a product of n copies of the affine line. And so its motive splits into a product of motives of the affine line. Each of these contributes L, and so we have L to the n. If we consider instead uh, the projective line, this can be written as uh, the union of an affine line with a point, which is going to be the point at infinity. And so uh, the corresponding motive is going to be L plus one. So L is the motive of the line and one is the motive of a single point. And similarly, we can split a projective space of dimension N into an affine space of dimension N and a projective space of dimension N minus one. And in a similar way, the projective space, the motive of projective space BN splits into uh, L to the N plus uh, the motive of P N minus one. But now we can do the same here. So we can write this as L to the N minus one plus the motive of P N minus two. And as you can see, we can proceed uh, recursively until we reach dimension zero. And so in conclusion, uh, the motive of the projective space is given by this uh, sum. L to the n plus L to the n minus one plus plus L plus one, okay? So these are some examples of motives and I hope this uh, clarifies a little bit what a motive is. Let's now move on to uh, quad schemes. So quad schemes are uh, moduli spaces which solve some classification problem. And I would like to start uh, by telling you what this a uh, moduli problem that we're trying to solve is. The data uh, that we start with are uh, these things here. So we start by fixing a quasi-projective scheme over the complex numbers. We're going to call this X. We fix a locally free sheaf on X of finite rank R, and we fix a non-negative integer. The objects that we want to classify are these surjections. Uh, where the domain is our locally free sheaf E, and the codomain is a coherent sheaf on X, which is uh, supported at finitely many points and has length equal to N. And these objects, uh, these surjections, we want to classify them up to isomorphisms of F. In particular, uh, I want to recall that uh, the support of a coherent sheaf is the set of points in the variety or scheme X where the stock is non-zero. So maybe at this point, it's not very clear what these objects are. So in the next slide, I would like to give a geometric interpretation so that we can uh, try to visualize uh, what is going on. What are these objects? And when I see uh, one of these points, uh, these surjections, uh, this is more what I think about. So let's try to uh, see what the uh, domain is, first of all. So uh, E is a locally free sheaf. So you can think about it as a vector bundle over a scheme or variety X uh, with a rank R. And on the other hand, uh, the codomain is given by a thing that kind of looks like this. So it's a bundle defined over X, but as you can see, the fibers are everywhere zero. So this is the zero section. The fibers are everywhere zero, except at finitely many points. These are the points uh, in the support. And over each of these points, we have a certain a fiber, which is a vector space. So for example, over P1, we have a fiber, which is a vector space of dimension D1. Over P2, we have a vector space of dimension D2. And the fiber over PK is a vector space of dimension DK. And what we want is the total dimension uh, to be equal to N. Okay, so uh, what you can, uh, the object in the codomain, you can think about it in this way. And what we're trying to classify is uh, surjections of this kind, more or less. 
Okay. So, as I said before, uh, quad schemes are uh, moduli spaces and they solve exactly this classification problem. So, uh, points of the quad scheme that we denote with this uh, notation, uh, quad, and here we have the scheme X, the sheaf E, and the length N, points of this quad scheme are in bijection with the equivalence classes of the objects that we want to classify. And there is a theorem by Grothendieck that guarantees that this object is indeed a quasi-projective scheme over the complex numbers. Now, um, in the next few slides, I would like to show you uh, some examples of quad scheme because uh, it can be uh, maybe a bit abstract object, quite complicated at first, but actually it generalizes uh, some objects that you might have already seen or you might already know. And the first example I would like to show is the Grassmannian. This is achieved when we choose uh, the space X to be a single point. So if we go back to the previous interpretation here, uh, you can see instead of uh, a variety, we have just a single point X. And so the locally free sheaf on top of a single point, this is a vector space uh, of dimension R. And the codomain is going to be, um, again, uh, just a single vector space over this point of dimension N. And what we're trying to classify, uh, it's clear now, are surjections of between these two vector spaces. And you, uh, the first remark I would like to make is that this only works, you can find these surjections only if the uh, dimension R of the first sheaf is larger than the dimension of the second space N, okay? Otherwise, you will not be able to find uh, surjections. And the second remark is that uh, classifying these surjections is equivalent to classifying the kernels. So really what we are looking at is subspaces of dimension R minus N inside a space of dimension R. And so you can see that the quad scheme defined over a single point is actually a Grassmannian of subspaces of dimension R minus N in a, sub, in a space of dimension R. And notice that this only works when N is smaller or equal than R. So this is the first example of quad scheme. The second example is uh, the Hilbert scheme of points. This is achieved when we choose the sheaf E to be the structure sheaf. And in particular, uh, the rank is going to be one in this case. And so uh, the quad scheme of the structure sheaf is going to be uh, the Hilbert scheme of points, which parametrizes closed subschemes of X of length N. And this is the second uh, example of quad scheme. So now that we have an idea of what motives and quad schemes are, we can move on to talk about uh, motives of quad schemes. And the case I'm mostly interested in is the case of curves. So let's start by fixing a smooth projective curve, which I'm going to denote by C, defined over the complex numbers. And this is uh, the main theorem I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it is a theorem proved by Bagnarol, Fantecchi, and Perroni in 2020. And this theorem tells us basically that uh, the motive of uh, the quad scheme defined over a smooth projective curve does not depend on uh, the specific choice of locally free sheaf E. It only depends uh, on the rank of the sheaf. Okay, so if we take the motive of the quad scheme associated to a locally free sheaf, it's going to be equal to the motive of the quad scheme associated to a free sheaf of the same rank. And uh, as for the right-hand side, uh, there has been a formula which was known uh, long before this theorem was proved, 
And the formula is due to BFET and was proved in 1989. I wrote, uh, wrote it here, but I'm not going to um, explain it for time constraints. But just know that uh, this formula was known long before this theorem was proved. Okay. So in the next uh, 10 minutes, more or less, I would like to give, uh, I try to give an explanation and intuition on why this theorem is true, okay? So that is going to be the goal for the next 10 minutes. And in order to do that, uh, I need to take a step back and go to the growth and ring again. So uh, remember, um, given two complex varieties, for example, X and P, what we can do is take the motive and we can take uh, the sum of these motives or we could take the product, but we can ask about other operations. So can we, for example, uh, take powers in the Grotendieck ring? So can we take the power of a motive with respect to another motive? And the answer is yes. And in fact, more can be done. And I'm going to define in this next slide uh, a power structure on the Grotendieck ring that allows us to uh, do these power operations in the growth and the ring. Uh, the data that we need to fix to begin with is uh, motives of varieties PK for every K non-negative integer, and then uh, the motive of a variety X. So the motives of these PK, we can pack them into a generating function, as you can see here. And then uh, we are going to define the power of this generating function with respect to x, the motive of x. The result of this operation is going to be another generating function. And here we have the motives of this yn, where yn is defined by this uh, a bit complicated formula, which I'm going to break down for you. So yn is defined as a disjoint union over partitions alpha of n. And each component, as you can see, uh, splits into a product of two factors. The first factor uh, is given by a product of a bunch of copies of x, which is the variety that we fixed at the beginning. And the number of time that x appears uh, for each k is equal to the number of times that k appears in the uh, partition. And once we take the product of all these x's, we just remove the large diagonal. So if any two elements are the same, we're going to remove them. And the second factor uh, is given by a product of um, copies of pk, where each pk appears with the same multiplicity. Moreover, on these two factors, there is an action of this group uh, S alpha, which is just a product of symmetric groups. And each symmetric group acts on uh, the two factors by uh, permutation in the obvious sense. So this there is a lot to unpack in this definition, and it can be a bit hard to keep everything in mind. But there is a very nice way to visualize it. And I'll try to convey this uh, in the next few slides. So let's go back to this equality. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, the generating function of these motives, uh, pk. We have uh, taken this to the power of x. And on the right-hand side, we have another uh, generating function, uh, which is given by uh, the generating function of the motives of yn. So what we can do, what we can think about is the following. We can think of um, pk as a space of particles of charge k. So a point inside the space is going to be a single particle of charge k. You can pick, I don't know, your favorite particle and, and think of it as a point inside here. Um, x. Uh, which appears at the exponent, is going to be uh, the ambient space where these particles can move, okay? 
And once we combine these two things together by taking powers, what we get on the right-hand side is a space Yn whose points are combinations of particles inside X whose total charge is exactly N. So to be uh, more clear, maybe I'll give you a few examples. So if we look at Y1, we are looking at combinations of particles of total charge one. And if you think about it, there is only one possible configuration. So a single point inside X with a particle of charge one, there are no other possibilities. But if we go and look at uh, higher uh, charges, let's say, so if we look at Y2, so combinations of particles of total charge two, we have two possible configurations. So a point, uh, with a single particle of charge two, or we could have two distinct points, each carrying a particle of charge one. So the total charge would be two. And each of these configurations corresponds to one of the two uh, components that Y2 breaks into. If we look instead at Y3, uh, according to the definition, this breaks down into three disjoint components, and each of these corresponds to one of these configurations. So in the first case, um, we have a single point carrying a particle of charge three, or we could have two distinct points, one carrying a particle of charge one and the other carrying a particle of charge two. So the total charge is again three, or we could have uh, three distinct points, each carrying a particle of charge one. And so again, the total uh, charge is three. And so uh, if we go back to the equality of the previous slide, uh, the moral, let's say, of this uh, power structure is the following. Uh, instead of studying uh, combinations of particles of a certain total charge, what we can do is the following. We could study uh, particles of a fixed uh, charge K concentrated at a single point, and then we can use the power structure, so we can take a power here, to get back all possible combinations okay, of particles of, char of total charge N. So the moral is that instead of studying a combination of particles, uh, we can study particles fit, uh, supported at one point, and then use the power structure to get uh, all possible combinations. Okay, so I hope that uh, this is more or less clear. And if it is, I will move on to, uh, I will actually show you again this slide with the geometric interpretation of a point in the quad scheme. And we can, uh, look again at the codomain of these surjections that we are trying to classify. So each F is essentially the datum of a finite number of points, B1 to BK inside X. And over each of these points, we have a vector space of a certain dimension. And what we could do here is use the idea of power structures. So instead of studying sheaves supported at finitely many points, having or carrying uh, vector spaces of a certain dimension on top of these points, what we could do is uh, study these surjections where the codomain is supported at only one point and carrying a vector space of a certain dimension. And then we could use uh, the power structure to get back um, the codomains F with uh, support at finitely many points and all possible combinations of uh, dimensions, okay? And to do this, uh, I'm going to introduce one more object, which is the punctual quad scheme. So if we fix a smooth point in our curve, we define uh, the punctual quad scheme as the moduli space that classifies uh, surjections where F is supported at a single point, the point P that we chose. And in terms of the power structure, 
we have the following equality. So this is exactly what we wanted. So this tells us that we can study uh, surjections where the quotient is supported only at a point P. And by taking uh, the generating function to the power, and we take this to the power of C, we get back all the um, points in the original quad schemes. So the surjections where the quotient is actually uh, supported at finitely many points. Okay, so this equality holds true in the Grothendieck ring of varieties. Okay, so now I would like to make uh, an observation, actually two observations. The first one is that uh, the punctual quad scheme um, actually only depends on a neighborhood of the point P. So up to restricting this neighborhood, we can assume that uh, the sheaf E is a free sheaf. And so in particular, if we replace this here, um, what we obtain is that this equality implies immediately the main theorem that I told about uh, in a, a few slides ago. And the second remark I would like to make is that none of what I said uh, up to this point really depends on the fact that C is a curve. In fact, if I if we go back a few uh, in the previous slide, uh, here at the bottom, I still used uh, the drawing where X is a two-dimensional thing. So uh, this means that uh, this equality can be immediately generalized to uh, spaces of higher dimension. And this is exactly what happens. So uh, not, lo not too long after uh, the main theorem was proved, uh, a generalization was provided where X is a smooth quasi-projective variety of any dimension. So the same equality holds for varieties of any dimension. And as a consequence, we immediately have that uh, the theorem of Pagnarol, Fantecchi, and Perroni also holds for uh, varieties of any dimension. So there is something I haven't told you yet. Uh, so I have, I have been cheating a little bit. And this is quite an important thing. So I haven't told you that uh, the punctual quad scheme uh, does not depend on the choice of P, on the choice of point, uh, as long as X is smooth. So if we move our point P on a smooth variety, uh, the punctual quad scheme is not going to change. And so this allows uh, all the previous machinery uh, to work. But whenever we uh, encounter a singular point, then bad things can happen. And this is exactly uh, what I'm working on. So in what happens basically is that when we have a singular scheme, uh, the punctual quad scheme is going to be constant for points in the smooth locus, but changes whenever we choose P to be a singular point. And the question I'm trying to answer is, what is the motive of the punctual quad scheme when P is a singular point of my scheme or variety. In particular, at the moment, I'm working on the computation of the punctual motive of the punctual quad scheme in the case of the node of a curve. So I'm considering the case, for example, where C is the union of the two coordinate axes and P is the node at the origin. And um, as far as uh, what things uh, are known up to this point. Uh, there is a theorem by Zivran, which was proved in 2005, which basically solves the rank one case. So the case of the Hilbert scheme of points. This theorem tells us that for a length n uh, larger or equal to two, the punctual Hilbert scheme uh, at a node of a curve is given by a chain of n minus one copies of the projective line. Uh, and you can see them pictured here. So each line is a copy of the projective line. 
And these lines intersect at n minus two points in this way. So each line intersects the next one at a point. And I pictured these points in blue. I don't know if you can see them. And given this theorem, um, we can immediately compute uh, the motive of the punctual Hilbert scheme at a node. So we have n minus one copies of P1. So here we're going to have n minus one times uh, the motive of P1, which I recall is L plus one. And the only thing we have to do is remove these intersection points because we have counted them twice. So we remove n minus two points. And the final result of this motive is n minus one L plus one. So uh, this is an example. This is in particular a solution for the case of rank one. And this is also an example of uh, what happens uh, when um, instead of choosing a smooth point, we choose a singular point. So the punctual Hibbert scheme at a node is given by this uh, formula, whereas if we were to choose a smooth point, the motive would be just one. Uh, the punctual Hibbert scheme at a smooth point is just one point. So this is an example of what happens when we hit a singular point. So I uh, think my time is over and uh, this is also the end of my presentation. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for the talk.